Um, so let me do the intro on Dee and hope that he can join us soon. Um, Dee Wilson, I think Randa Downs knows him well, uh, worked for 26 years. He was in Washington State in the child welfare system, and he worked his way up from a caseworker to an area regional administrator, training director, and into management jobs. But then um, he also worked at the, the University of Washington School of Social Work, which is a really well-known, well-respected school, uh, doing training there as well. And um, then he worked for Casey Family Programs in the knowledge management section from 2010 to 2015. And, and Randa, I won't surprise you, Randa worked there as well. Uh, that um, some of you would be surprised to hear that because we have been pretty persistent critics of Casey Family Programs because of their role in inventing and then promoting alternative response, which is called family assessment here in Minnesota, uh, and thinking that uh, many children have been harmed by those uh, unsafe practices. So I was surprised uh, to hook up with Dee and find out that he was there. But I think that he was there as sort of, uh, you know, a voice uh, uh, for a different point of view. Uh, it looks like we may be getting him here. I see a 253 area code. So, and he's- Yeah, really D was the squeaky wheel. He was yeah. a squeaky wheel at Casey. Man, that must've been difficult. That must've been a difficult role because um, it's they, they are just um, really locked in on their point of view about yes. child welfare. Uh, yeah. So since then, since he left, and we're gonna hear about his views on some of these things, but uh, he has done training uh, on various child welfare topics, chronic neglect in particular, which is one of his specialties. Mm -hmm. Author of a, a blog called Sounding Board, which is uh, done monthly, and I believe, I'm not sure about this, I believe they're all printed in this online child welfare magazine called The Imprint. So you can look up the imprint and get the sounding board, or you can just, uh, you, know, you know, Google Sounding Board and read his stuff. Uh, Dee has been a big help in our current study of child fatalities in Minnesota, uh, reviewing cases for us, giving his input, and particularly helping us to identify ones that are legitimately categorized as uh, cases of torture. Uh, and I'm going this week to, uh, in our, my weekly blog on Friday, talk about his story, his article that was in 2015, where he and two other authors did a 30-year kind of retrospective on research on child fatalities. And you just try to unpack that very complicated article. Um, and then um, I did both the blog and there'll be a podcast as well. So if you want more, uh, Dee Wilson, there it is. Is that you, Dee? Yeah, All believe right, it or not. <laughs> Good. Hey, well, a, lot of, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of frustration here, to say the least. There. Okay. Well, uh, we're just glad to have you and glad that we were worried that it was a time zone problem that we, we didn't communicate the right time. So um, anyway, we have no. a group of people here. And, totally uh, a problem in the AOL. AOL, yeah. Well, um, at least at least you were able to get in my phone. Uh, so I think let's just go ahead. I've done all the introduction to you. And uh, the one thing, and I was talking about your help uh, with the uh, fatality report in terms of reviewing cases, in particular your help on the torture questions. Um, but I said that your your uh, blog, the, the uh, sounding board, is published in the imprint. Is that where it's usually or always published, or is that just sometimes? How does that work? No, that's just recently. That That's the last two of them. I published these for 11 years, but the last two have been published on imprint, and they've made a commitment or a promise to me that they're going to, from here on in, until they make some other decision, they're going to print them. But I've only had two of them in imprint. There is, however, a website where anyone can look at all the sounding boards, and I have over 140 of them. I mean, I have a lot of sounding boards. Um, so, I'll, you know, I'll give people the website. You know, and then yeah. the other thing to do if they, because I've written a lot of, about a lot of subjects, if people have particular interest in something like torture, this thing we're going to talk about today, I wrote a sounding board on that. And I've written on many other subjects. And if someone sends me a request for sounding boards on a particular subject, I would be glad to send them the sounding board. Right. And I've read a number. So I wonder, Stephanie, if you can maybe look that up and put it in the chat box. I looked it up earlier today, but I forgot to copy it so I could put it in the chat box. The the, the um, you know, a link to the sounding board. But I've yeah. read quite a number. I can do that. Okay, thanks. And um, I've read a number of them. And uh, we are pretty closely aligned 
with uh, the with uh, D's point of view, in um, as he as he says it. So if you want another voice that is uh, you know touching on the same topics as we are, and D, uh, so I just uh, I just kind of went through your bio and introduced you. So I think I'll just let you run with it for a while. You're going to talk about torture, and that's you know a grim topic, but it's one that we have to pay attention to. So. Um, just take it away, and we'll have hopefully some time for Q and A uh, after you're done. Okay, yeah, and I would invite anyone to at any point interrupt me and ask questions. This is very difficult. It's even difficult with Zoom, as all of you know, to do interaction and back and forth, and you know, more difficult with phone. But you know, anyone can stop me at some point if you want. Here, so is everyone able to hear me now? Yes, I am. Yep. Okay. Okay, so just give a little bit of a background here. So I had worked in child welfare in two states for 32 years. I worked in Colorado for seven years. I worked in Washington State for almost for over 26 years. Okay, so 30, 32, 33 years in child welfare. <clears throat> I had never encountered a child death from either torture or starvation. And as I'm going to talk about here, these two things are related. Uh, sort of the systematic denial of food and water to kids. In the entire 32 years that I was in the public, two public child welfare systems, I never encountered that, never. And I'm quite sure it never happened in Washington State because there was a time when I would have known about it. Okay, I did occasionally, when I was a caseworker and then later on as a supervisor, I would occasionally encounter um, punishments that I would describe as torture. I, very infrequently, but occasionally they happen. An example would be something like a caregiver, sometimes a foster parent, uh, putting a child in a ice cold bathtub for 45 minutes or something until the child's frozen or something, right? And so I, I encountered that a couple of times. I, I once had a case where a, a mother of a teenager was using an electric prod on the kid. I mean, you know, very mean way, um, and, and uh, that, well, those were highly unusual things, but they did occasionally happen, but they did not result in child death. And so after uh, just about six months after I left, uh, I was a regional administrator for seven years in Washington State, and after I left that job to go to the University of Washington, within a few months, there was a very uh, uh, horrible child death in Eastern Washington, where I had worked for 17 years. And in this particular instance, a child, a seven-year-old child, was systematically starved to death and also denied water. And this child ended up actually dying of dehydration. Uh, the child lived in an adoptive home with a woman who had been considered, had adopted multiple children. Uh, who were very troubled kids and was viewed as almost a saint in the Spokane area where I had worked. She had very strong ties with the medical profession. She knew people that I knew. Uh, she was a very, very well-connected person. She was a paralegal, professional person. She had moved up north to Deer Park, this area, and she had adopted this child a few years before, and when he was about three or four, and he had been a traumatized child and very mistreated since his birth. And she had gradually gotten into very much of a power struggle with this child over food. And over a period of uh, more than a year, it could have been even longer than that, she uh, established very, very severe controls around the food input that this child could have, insisting that, for example, he could only get it, eat at mealtime. She would limit his um, intake of water. Uh, she even went to the school to um, enlist them in this uh, therapeutic kind of course of action. So they were having this conflict over food intake. And the school ended up making multiple CPS reports, which for the most, most part weren't followed up on because every time they would make a report intake, the intake people, this woman was a doctor parent, they would, they would the intake people would call her and make an appointment and she'd say, well, just talk with my pediatrician. We've agreed on this as a way of dealing with this problem behavior, which indeed was true. And so there were initially not CPS investigations despite this. And then so to describe how extreme this whole thing was, 
At one point, this adoptive mother even went to school to convince the school people, one, not to feed this child anything outside of the snack time or lunch, number one. And secondly, to even accompany him to the toilet so that he would not be able to drink out of the toilet bowl, water out of the toilet bowl, right? Well, even the school understood that as pretty bizarre, extreme behavior, and they continued then at that point, especially the teachers to make CPS reports. Okay. When this child was seven years old, this would have been in January of 2005, something like that. This child then tried to break out his window one evening to eat snow because then this child died the next day of dehydration at seven years old. So it turned out in the police investigation, and there was just, let me just describe a monumental shitstorm in the Caldwell area over this case because the school had made so many reports. And for the most part, they had not been followed up on or investigated. And so there was a very extensive law enforcement investigation. Uh, this uh, mother was eventually charged with uh, uh, either murder or with manslaughter, I'm not sure which. It turned out that the child had also been beaten, very, very severely beaten, as well as systematically starved and denied water over a very long period of time. So this was the first time, first instance, that I had ever encountered a case of torture. I would call that the systematic denial of food and water. That's kind of the ultimate expression of parental power over the power of life and death over young children. So first time I'd ever encountered that. So uh, within the next several years, there then were a number of other deaths in this state, some of them quite famous deaths. And most of these deaths actually happened in adoptive homes, if you can believe this. So um, so at one point there, within about a two to three year period, there had been 10, 12 deaths of adoptive kids within a two to three. So of course that just is, what the hell, what the, what's going on here? So the Ombuds office in this state then uh, did a, got together a, a very prestigious committee of people, professionals, experts to review these cases. And it, they issued a report in 2012, which by the way is available online which was a study of the deaths and adoptive homes in this state. And there had been a whole bunch of them. Um, and um, they issued a report in 2012. Well, anyway, since then, there have been other cases, not bunched like that, but have many of the same features. And many of them have happened in adoptive homes. Some have happened in foster homes. And a few have happened in the homes of parents, not as many as an adoptive home. So this is where I first started to think, so this is a very unusual. So if you know anything about child maltreatment deaths, you know that most of these deaths occur to very young children, you know, particularly the infants, about 45% of all maltreatment deaths are of infants. 80% of all child maltreatment deaths are of kids in the zero to three year old age range. Kids who are six to 17 rarely die from child maltreatment. That's very unusual. And in these cases, then in these adoptive families and a couple in foster families and in birth families, these were actually, for the most part, school-age kids who were dying. So it's something very, very unusual. So that told me right off the bat, there's a different dynamic here. Something different is going on here. So um, I started then to carefully look at and review these cases in this state. And then there turned out to be similar ones in other states as well. <clears throat> And so, um, so I was able to, over a period of years, to identify a dynamic there, which is different than the dynamic that accounts for most child, child maltreatment deaths, which, which are of kids in the zero to three, zero, four year old age range. And so, what most people think initially to hear about deaths like this, such extreme kind of behaviors. I mean, so things like the combination of denial of food and water, that's the single most common shared trait of these cases, but usually combined with abuse, with a lot of physical abuse. In a couple of famous cases in the state, kids have been chained in the backyard in winter, forced to sleep outside, and, you know, had either died of hypothermia or were at risk of dying of hypothermia. In a couple of the cases, kids have also been beaten by other kids in the family. That is, they have been scapegoated within the family, not only by the parents, but by 
other children in the family. And of course, these cases always have involved a lot of emotional abuse and neglect, always. And so, so the thing that stands out in these cases of torture is that it's, a, it's not that you're dealing for the most part with mentally ill people. I mean, that's what everyone thinks initially, but it just isn't true. At least in the cases, particularly in the cases of adoptive families and foster families in this state where these deaths have occurred. It's a lot of times, I mean, I've, I've consulted on cases in the last few years in this state where business owners, I mean, upper middle class people who've adopted kids have gotten involved in power struggles with their kids and were engaging these same kind of behaviors that did not, however, result in death because CPS people now in this state have learned to recognize this, which they didn't before. They didn't even recognize this which is kind of one of the things I want to talk about here today, because torture has been so infrequent. I mean, very rare, as I've already mentioned, in child protection cases over the years that even very experienced CPS people just haven't seen much of it. Not this type of stuff that involves kids dying, you know, of starvation or dehydration. Um, and so the, the assumption is, well, parents must be mentally ill, but no, not really true. Um, I mean, what seems to have happened in the cases is that the parents, many of whom had done perfectly fine with other kids, had gotten involved with a power struggle with a particular child, usually a child with a trauma history who had issues of meltdowns, emotion regulation kind of difficulty, and had began to use food and water as a sort of initially as a way to control child behavior. And then that power struggle over time had become malignant. And so I guess the theme that I want to emphasize here is that power struggles are very common in families, I mean, in all families. And, um, and yet there's something different about the power struggles, obviously, that ultimately evolve into torture. Those are power struggles that have become malignant. And one of the first ways of telling that is that a parent becomes determined that they are going to break a child's will at all costs. They're involved in a conflict with an oppositional child. A lot of times a child who has issues around emotion regulation, that is, they're very quick to throw tantrums, to melt down. And gradually, the whole kind of uh, desire or uh, actually determination to break that child's will at all costs ends up with a very, very extreme behavior. Um, and so it begins as an effort kind of to break a child's will. It ends up with sometimes with almost a hatred of the child and with inflicting cruelty almost for its own sake. Um, now, the cases that we've dealt with, this is one group of cases, and the ones that I've talked about in adoptive homes and foster homes, but there have also been, of course, in recent years, very famous cases in families. Um, and maybe the most famous in recent years, of course, is the Gabriel Fernandez case in Los Angeles County, which happened in 2013 which then became the subject of a Netflix documentary. Some of you may have seen that documentary, that six part series on Gabriel. Gabriel was eight years old uh, and he had been separated from his mother in early life because she had been in prison. And she had definitely had mental health problems as well as addiction issues. And then she ends up, this child lives with family members or friends of family members for most of his early life, but there's not a change of custody of Gabriel. At some point, mother takes him back. And then in the next year, year and a half, uh, the mother and the boyfriend just do horrible, terrible things to Gabriel that are documented in the documentary and in many, many news stories in the Los Angeles Times and in other papers in the LA area. And, you know, many of you probably, some of you probably have seen the documentary. If you hadn't, you know, it's worth looking at. It's painful, painful to look, to, to watch all this. But they also, of course, starved Gabriel. They put him in a closet at night with a sock stuffed in his mouth, as an example. They shot him in the chest with BB gun pellets. They made him eat his own vomit, as an example. They sent him to school in girls' clothes. So the, the, the characteristics of torture, you know, at the margins, uh, people can have differences about what's the difference between extreme physical punishment and torture. And there are probably some marginal cases where there could be reasonable disagreement on that subject. 
At the extremes, however, there's, there can be no disagreement whatsoever. That is, in, in, in cases like the one that I mentioned with this little boy, the seven-year-old in Colville, or with Gabriel Fernandez, there's no question at all about the torture issue. I mean, it's very deliberate, very thoughtful punishment, very sadistic, very cruel. And of course, in addition to just the physical aspect of the punishment, it involves the dehumanization, the humiliation of a child. And so this is one of the characteristics of torture, right? It is a way of demeaning people. And this is true whether it's kids involved, whether it's adults in any setting, whether it's in the military, whether it's in the police, in any setting whatsoever. If someone is engaging in torture in these kind of extreme behaviors, whatever they say they're doing is a rationale. The underlying goal there is to humiliate the person and to break them. And that's what sets torture off from in my view, extreme physical punishment, and even the kind of impulsive lashing out, you know, the battered child syndrome cases that account for some degree of child murders when kids are infants or toddlers or two or three or whatever. Um, it's, the, it's the very deliberate, thoughtful infliction, very cruel punishment. Uh, over usually, and particularly when you talk about these school-aged kids, over some period of time. And of course, when it comes about a school-aged kid, it really takes some time to starve a kid to death. That's not something one does overnight. You know, that's something that's done over a period of months and a lot of times over longer than a period of months. So some of you may be familiar with this Natalie Finn case that happened in Iowa, in your area of the world, a couple of years ago, where this 16-year-old child was starved to death by an adoptive mother in, in Iowa. Um, and again, when we're talking in adoptive homes, we're talking about a lot of times well-educated people, articulate, they can always find a rationale for their behavior, but it's BS. I mean, what they've done here is very sadistic and cruel, right? So that's, uh, so it turns out that those kind of cases used to be exceedingly rare, as I've mentioned in child welfare. Now they're no longer rare. I read about them every week or two in the news bulletins that are published in the Child Welfare Gateway News brief, which all of you can read. That's free online. Comes out Monday through Friday. I read stories about this every day, and some of them are in adoptive homes, some are in foster homes, some are in parents' homes. I mean, all, all of the above. Um, so it's become, it's still uncommon. It's no longer rare. Um, and in fact, it's common enough in Washington State that I get called um, two or three times a year, usually to consult on cases in the state where caseworkers have recognized the signs, right? And so there are just some signs right off the bat. You know, anytime you're talking about the systematic denial of food and water, and I don't mean sending a child home, sending a child away from the table one night for bad behavior, something like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about doing it over a period of weeks or months where food intake is severely limited. Now, just an example, this seven-year-old in Caldwell that I mentioned, this child was seven years old. At death, he was 28 pounds. 28 pounds at death at seven years old. And of course, the school was distraught. Of course they were, because they could see the child starving to death right in front of them. And yet this paralegal professional person was articulate enough to be able to actually rationalize her behavior and to have it supported by physicians in the Spokane area. That's what actually happened in that case, right? And there have been similar other cases in this state where that behavior has been defended by mental health therapists or by people who have worked with, uh, you know, a parent around how to deal with an opposition child or with a child who has emotion regulation difficulties. So let me stop there before I go on. I'm going to talk about another group of cases here, but let me just stop there and see if people have comments. Okay. Questions, comments, just please jump in. Oh, um, okay. Stephanie, the people are saying they're muted. Can we, can you unmute all? Um, she should be able, can you unmute yourself, Lisa? Otherwise I can. 
I have a mute all, but I don't have an unmute. Yeah, an unmute all. I think so. I think you have Let to. Let me look at that. Lisa, can you type your um, question or else you could text it to me and um, I can I can speak it if you want to text it to me. Looks like she, Lisa, can you type it? I'll figure out the muting issue. Oh, and Lisa says they're muted too. How can this be? Um, let me try something. Oh, well, Lisa, but somebody else said that as well. Julia, maybe? Okay, well, go ahead. Uh, I'll read the question. Why do you think it's more common now? That's what I was going to ask as well. What happened? Was there either people just weren't recognizing it or did, was there actually a change to you suddenly these things started to become less rare? Um, I guess I can only speculate here a little bit. And I think part of this just has to do with um, how many children or particularly kids who've had extreme trauma histories there are eventually being adopted. And, you know, so, so I think a lot of times what's happened is that a lot of kids, very, very troubled kids, who ended up being exceedingly, grossly, extremely maltreated in early life, very traumatized type of kids, both neglected and abused, as I'm gonna talk about here in just a minute, end up going into foster families or adoptive families who are not prepared to deal with that. And so particularly not able to deal with the emotion regulation kind of difficulty. And because these families a lot of times receive poor guidance, poor support, just not prepared to deal with this child population. You end up a lot of times with these kind of people, uh, sometimes the substitute caregivers become desperate. And they end up going to experts, supposed experts, who then give them all kind of bizarre advice. Or, you know, that used to be in past years, they would, some of the adoptive parents would read books about a reactive attachment disorder. That was a very common diagnosis in the 1980s, 1990s. And it has become kind of a, almost a, I don't want to say a joke, but it's become a very questionable diagnosis among therapists in recent years. But fam families found all these descriptions of the kids that they were dealing with in books or with experts on adoption or reactive attachment disorder when they weren't getting help from either of the agencies that gave them the kids in the first place or the mental health people that were supposedly supposed to help them in the community. So they're, de they're, they're desperate. They, they can't, don't know how to deal with these kids. And so then they end up with these extreme kind of strategies of their own. And as I've mentioned, this, this adoptive mother in Colville had the support of pediatricians, and, not, and I mean more than one. And now, I'm not saying that they were endorsing what she was doing they weren't endorsing what she was doing. They were endorsing some reasonable version of what she was doing, reasonable from their perspective. She just took it as a sort of a license, as an endorsement of taking that strategy to its ultimate kind of extreme. And by the way, in that particular instance, after that child had been murdered and this woman was charged, there was investigations of, of course, her uh, parenting of other children in the family because she had adopted other kids. Well, it turned out that she had engaged in many of the same kind of behaviors as other kids, but not to the point of causing them to die. But um, the other kids in the family knew what was going on there, right? It wasn't just that one child. In some other cases here, it has been, there, that there has been one child that scapegoated, right? Um, so, but one other thing I do want to mention just about the Washington State, I'm not saying that this explain thing nationally, anything like that. There were several of these deaths within about a two to three year period in Washington state after there had been a very intensive adoption initiative in the state where uh, the state was determined to get kids out of foster care and was pushing adoptions. Uh, and was, so uh, adoptive caseworkers were then had an incentive to put kids with families who could not handle them. And, and, so I think for that period, that two or three year period where there are so many cases, that was probably part of the reason. Thereafter, however, not. And so here you're dealing with kind of one of the sort of needs here that sort of stands out in some of these cases where kids have died in adoptive families or have been tortured in foster families is that there really is a, 
the trauma-informed care stuff, there, there, really, there really is a knowledge base out there that wasn't there 15, 20 years ago. And it really has to do with how to deal with emotional reactivity in kids and with the meltdown issue. And so this is something that sort of a lesson to take home here is that there are wonderful resources on these particular subjects available in child welfare at this point. Or, um, so in this um, state, for example, we have a therapist whose name is Deborah Gray, who's written books on adoption, one of them called Nurturing Adoption. He just has tremendous guidelines and, and a concrete ideas and assistance to adoptive parents and the foster parents and to birth parents as well about how to deal with emotionally reactive kids who are liable to meltdown. I mean, so she's right here, but our child welfare system hardly ever even makes use of her, even though she goes all over the world doing training. But, her, you know, you can buy her book for less than 20 bucks, and her book is great. And her book isn't the only one. There's just a whole bunch of resources out there for how to do better with this whole thing. Now, the most important lesson, however, and the one that I kind of want to underline here is that Power struggles are very, very manageable. We all deal with them in families. These are just, this is just family life, a lot of it. And we can stop power struggles in our own families or in the families of others pretty quickly if we identify them early on before they get out of hand. And so I can't say too much about the need for early intervention here. And this is why denial, refusing to see this, refusing to admit it, refusing to acknowledge, not wanting to deal with it. That is so incredibly dangerous here because once these power struggles become malignant, once they have entered the phase where a parent is going to uh, break a child's will, where that is an overt goal, then there is no treatment for that. And I want to come back to this theme here in just a minute. But in the early stages, very, very treatable. And a lot of times you don't even need treatment, you just need common sense need someone in a family just to say, hey, you guys got to stop this. I mean, this is not sensible. What's going on here? Um, but once things have reached a, a tipping point, then there is no treatment. And so this is sort of the take-home lesson to child welfare. Once there is torture identified in a family, and I mean any family, whether that's a birth family, foster family, or adoptive family, the child has to be removed. That's it. There's no evidence-based practice. There's no therapeutic course of action. There's no mental health treatment. Nada. The child has to be removed. But early on, it's very, very possible to stop this. Um, apart from the fact that we're putting traumatized kids in with people who don't have a clue about trauma or what it entails or how to deal with the motion regulation difficulties and so forth. So that's just inexcusable from the child welfare point of view here, right? So that, that's one sort of class of cases. Now, there is another class of cases, and I didn't realize maybe how common they were until I reviewed some of the child deaths in Minnesota that Richard sent me and his staff there recently. and. Um, and then Rich, they certainly, you know, the Rich, they sent me subsequently 13 other cases to look at where there were elements of torture there. And these were uh, pretty much in birth families, right? And the birth families had pretty much the same kind of characteristics. That is, they were families that I described, I'm writing a sounding board on this now, chronically maltreating families. So there's, there's a, those are families where there's, there's a combination of chronic neglect, which I'll talk about in a minute, combined with physical abuse and or sexual abuse. So not just chronic neglect, the chronic neglect combined with elements of physical abuse or sexual abuse that always involves an emotional abuse and neglect component to that, always. So that's what I call as a, as a chronic, chronic maltreatment. So chronic maltreatment evolves out of chronic neglect. So there is a kind of a dynamic here that situational neglect evolves into intermittent neglect. Intermittent neglect evolves into chronic neglect. Chronic neglect ultimately evolves, and a lot of times pretty quickly, into chronic maltreatment. So this isn't only a classification system for cases within the child welfare system. 
it's also a dynamic. It says that something is going on in family that is causing this kind of a progression, right? Well, what is that something? Well, in the chronically maltreating families, it's two main dynamics. It's the erosion or the collapse of social norms around parenting. I want to say that again. It's the erosion or the collapse of social norms around parenting, which I'll come back to this in a minute. And the second dynamic there is the loss of self-efficacy, the gradual disempowerment of body, mind, social circumstances, all, all of the above here. So how does, how does that happen? So think about, so what happens with chronically neglecting families is that the parents have underlying, of course, chronically relapsing conditions. So they have drug alcohol issues, mental health issues, a lot of times there's domestic violence. And about 15% of the families, there's cognitive impairments. Parents have IQs of 80 or below. Uh, high rates of parental incarceration, all kind of other issues in those families. You know, not to mention the obvious one about poverty. Right. Um, over time, under the pressure of those psychological afflictions, then um, the ability to maintain a parenting structure breaks down. That's one of the first things that happens in chronic neglect. And then after that, all kind of uh, uh, egregious violations of normal standards around parenting began to occur. And for example, an unwritten standard about parenting, which most people in this society would understand, is that Kids who are in the preschool age range have to be supervised at all times. That would be an expectation. You don't have to write it in law. That's, that's a part of our culture. We have an understanding of that and kind of the reason why that would be important in homes that have appliances and all kinds of things which can end up hurting kids, right? So the violation of a, of a, for a standard of supervision, for example, would be beginning to leave a kid alone for periods of time, sort of minor violations of a supervisory standard. And then ultimately, for, for very long periods of time, and we had one famous case in Washington State um, uh, about 15 years ago where a mother was leaving a 20-month-old toddler in a playpen for two or three days at a time while she lived with her boyfriend. And then she would come home every two to three days to clean up the plate in. Well, the idea there is that this mother didn't go from leaving the child alone for a few minutes to do something to a few hours to do go out with her girlfriend uh, for social occasion to leaving a child alone for two to three days. You know, so the idea is that parenting standards erode over time, and they erode gradually when there aren't interventions or when, and, and an intervention doesn't necessarily mean a CPS report. It can be someone in extended family saying, this is not okay. I mean, the way you're dealing with this is not okay. Or we're very concerned. I mean, someone has to step in and say something. And that is a function of CPS, even when you don't give people services, right? It's a function of it's a function of schools. It's a function of all the sort of institutions in a community. It's to maintain those kind of standards. It doesn't always have to be through a CPS report, a CPS agency, but it really has to be done there. And so once those families, those uh, standards begin to erode, then little by little, just about anything becomes possible. And in the, many of the chronically maltreating families, that's exactly what's happened. So for example, in one of the cases that Rich sent me from Minnesota, I don't know whether this was Minneapolis or wherever it was, this was this eight-year-old child, an eight-year-old child had died of hypothermia and had been put in the garage overnight, right? And apparently that wasn't that unusual in that family for that to happen. And in addition, the child had been beaten. Um, and so that's what I mean by, you know, an erosion of, so, you know, so that, that, that family took years to get like that. I mean, that's the point I'm trying to kind of make here. Right? And so that, that, that case, some of these chronic maltreatment cases, then, but not all of them, a small percentage of them be, begin to have elements of torture in them. Very deliberate, thoughtful, sadistic ways of dealing with child misbehavior from a parent's point of view. Um, and in some of those cases, some of the ones that I read from Minnesota, Parental mental illness, parental mental health problems, along with addiction, was very, very much of a fact. So that's sort of a different way of getting to the same point. Now, there's a lot of chronic maltreatment. 
that does not involve torture. I mean, very serious abuse and neglect of kids. There were kids who were being maltreated in multiple ways. And that, in my view, that is the most difficult therapeutic problem that child welfare agencies have to deal with in this country. You know, I'm, I mentioned I'm writing a sounding board about that now. I don't think it's a well understood sort of a, a type of maltreatment. I think it's been minimized within public agencies, dealt with very, very poorly. And so we end up, you know, as some of the cases that I saw, kids had grown up. I mean, some of these cases, kids were adolescents. They had had 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 reports. Uh, they had been neglected, physically abused, sexually abused, not only by a, a parent, a step parent, by extended family members. I mean, and um, some had been in foster care for brief periods of time. And so they are cases pretty much that child welfare systems that really have a lot of trouble, particularly when they've let this go for a long time. They have a lot of trouble in finding a therapeutic intervention that even the parents would even accept for one second. Um, so, Every incentive within child welfare systems to operate in a way that minimizes the development of chronic maltreatment. And you can only do that through early intervention kind of approaches here, right? You know, you want to involve, this is why early intervention is so important, whether it's inside child welfare or outside child welfare, you want to do something that's halfway reasonable before things get to some extreme point where it's very difficult to do anything at all. Uh, so we can actually stop child mal chronic child maltreatment from occurring, but not if everyone ignores it until it's, you know, there are 8, 10, 15, 20 reports and kids are being neglected, abused, and sexually abused within families. At that point, it's very difficult to do anything about it. Um, so, you know, I train uh, caseworkers in this state on chronic neglect. I've done this training for a long time, 15, 20 years, something like that. You know, most of those trainings, I'll start off with asking uh, caseworkers, well, how many uh, report, what's the most reports you ever saw in a family within your office? I never hear, if I have a, a group of 10 or more people on the train, I never hear an answer that's less than 30, 40, 50. One time in Seattle a few years, over 100 reports. So, those are outlier cases, those aren't averages, but they're still, nevertheless, there are lots of them. There are lots of them. And in this case, in this state, there are hundreds and thousands of cases with double digit CPS reports. And those reports, as I mentioned, have these common kind of traits. They're mostly, most of the reports are for neglect, but the more reports there are, the more likely they are to have elements of physical abuse or sexual abuse in them. And some of these torture cases, then a small number, evolve out of that child maltreatment kind of dynamic, where anything at all ultimately becomes possible in that family. And by anything at all, I mean child prostitution. I mean sexual exploitation. I mean forcing kids to sleep outside in the winter. Um, feeding kids whenever you feel like. Uh, beating the shit out of them if they're mouthy or not, or letting them run completely wild. You know, I, I dealt with um, um, a case last year in a tort action in this case where a substance abusing mother who had come out of prison and periodically was relapsing and so forth. She was letting her 13, 14 year old daughter, you know, sleep with in her home with the boyfriend who was 16 or 17 and just on a routine basis, right? That's, that's kind of, and also, by the way, and that's the case, that, that kid was preyed on sexually by a friend of the mother with the full knowledge of the mother because the guy gave the mother money. That's what I mean by anything becomes possible. But in the initial stages, it isn't like that. It takes a long time to get to that point. Okay, so let me stop there. So this is the, so what I've said now is I've identified two different kind of dynamics here for how you end up with torture. And the one is through power struggles that get out of hand and become malignant. And the second one is through the development of chronic maltreatment in which there's a 
eventually a collapse of social norms around parenting, and any pretty much anything at all becomes possible within that. Maybe I'll stop there for a second. Are you there? Hello? Oh, yes, we're here. Yep, we're here. Yeah, I thought I'd lost everybody. I was looking at my phone uh -huh. and thought, well, maybe I knocked off uh -huh. a phone. Something like that. I was, so, finally, yeah, let me... I was finally able to get myself unmuted um, by going to the upper right hand corner of the video to a little blue box. Yeah. And clicking on that. Uh, the other usual ways of unmuting did not work, but that little blue box in the upper right hand corner seemed to work for those of you that are trying to unmute. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not. Yeah. Um, uh, the one question, or uh, I guess, yeah, I guess it's a question that I'd ask is that Safe Passages of Minnesota is focused a lot on looking at systemic change and specifically looking at statutory legislative action that might be needed to make improvements in the child welfare, child protection system. From what you're talking about and from what you have reviewed in these kinds of cases, are there any legislative, statutory, systemic changes that you can see that would be derived from this material? Uh, yeah, and so let me just mention two or three of them. And as I mentioned, I'm currently working on a sounding board on this very subject now, which is going to come out next week. But I can give you some of my thinking. And I already give you a little bit of the thinking on the subject, but let me just repeat this a little bit here. So in the first place, when we talk about, particularly about traumatized kids within child welfare systems, for many of those kids, we're going to need professional foster parents. So that's one of the things that ultimately is going to have to happen in child welfare in this country. And particularly with a lot of the traumatized kids with emotional reactivity problems, ultimately we're going to have to that. Is, and remember, a lot of kids who are, most of the kids who are being adopted are being adopted out of foster care, right? And so particularly, child welfare systems have to become better at dealing with the developmental issues of kids. It's not just with dealing with child safety issues, as important as that is. You've also got to be able to deal with developmental repair there. And, you know, you guys have a famous um, developmental repair program out of that developed in Hennepin County by Ann Garrity, you know, that was delivered at Washburn Guidance Clinic years and years ago, at least when I was at Casey, you know, and I've written about that particular program. So that, that, that kind of knowledge is out there. Um, from the standpoint of dealing in child welfare, so two or three things to say here right off the bat. For there to be more effective kind of approaches here, there's going to have to be a huge infusion of poverty-related services at the upfront point. So right now, the reason we're getting all these social justice critiques in child welfare, the reason we're getting all this, you know, issues around surveillance and so forth is we're dealing with very punitive systems that don't have a lot of benefits for families a lot of the time. So that, that is a true indictment. So that, that has to be changed. That has to be changed at the policy and at the budget level so that child welfare involvement brings benefits. It brings actually poverty-related services to families who really need those kind of services. So there really does have to be, and if we're going to stop the evolution of neglect into chronic neglect, that has to be done, to say this again, early on. It can't be done after chronic neglect. It developed, you know, there's going to be a low rate of success for that. There have got to be different kind of administrative arrangements there to deal with the chronic neglect. And by the way, chronic neglect is probably anywhere from one-fifth to one-third of all screened-in CPS reports in most state systems. This isn't a small number. One of the reasons, for example, that you remember that child welfare systems were developed out of concern with battered child syndrome. Battered child syndrome was never more than one to two percent of all reports, never. And maybe not even as much as that, right? Chronic neglect, chronic maltreatment, that's one-fifth to one-third of all screening cases. And that is where that is where child welfare systems are utterly, completely failing at the time. So that there really have to be some changes there, not only the obvious ones about 
people have to be paid adequately and they have to be supported and all that kind of stuff. But there need to be different kind of administrative arrangements. And so, and by that, I mean that many of those chronic families need to be handled within case management teams that involve a CPS caseworker, a substance abuse assessment specialist, a mental health specialist, sometimes a public health nurse, sometimes someone from DV, a parent advocate. There need to be these four or five person management teams that sit together in offices that they have these professionals from various sectors and they they share in the responsibility for 20 to 25 families with about 40 kids. So we need a new administrative model. I guess this is what I'm kind of saying. Now, what I don't think is possible, and let me say the things that have failed in child welfare repeatedly over and over again to make these systems better or to make them, to help them protect kids better. Generally speaking, assessment tools have been completely failed. You know, the, the, to try to make, generally speaking, to try to make child welfare agencies do various procedures, you know, they're like uh, investigate the case more quickly, or um, you have to see every child in the family in every case. You have to, um, all those efforts that I've had to do with expanding the sort of the procedural and policy frameworks within child welfare, that's the strategy that's been used for 30 years. It is a failed strategy. So why do the same stuff over and over again? That's never going to work here. Um, so there, there have to be, there's gonna to have to be some better understanding here. There has to be a different kind of administrative framework. That's the other thing that I've mentioned around the chronic neglect, chronic maltreatment kind of cases. Um, there's going to have to be professional foster parents at some point for some of the behaviorally troubled kids within child welfare. Um, and then, of course, there's going to have to be a, a actual implementation, not just rhetoric, of trauma-informed care there, kind of at all kind of levels there. Um, so now on the torture thing, I do want to mention here, just to go back here there for just a second. When I first, I began doing, I left Casey in 2016. I began doing training in this state in 2016. At that point, I sat down with training staff. At that point, they weren't even, they didn't even have a training curriculum, unfortunately. My guess is that the people in LA who dealt with the Gabriel Fernandez case, my guess is they had never heard one word in training or unfortunately. So, you know, Training isn't an answer to all of our problems in child welfare, but that you really do have to tell people about the stuff that they're going to, that they may encounter. I mean, that really is important. You really do have to do that. And there was a reluctance here to do that for a very long time. I mean, among the training staff and among child welfare staff, because generally speaking, a lot of child advocates in, in child welfare don't want to admit that these kind of things can even happen. How can it even be true people can torture kids? And so people who are sort of generally pro-ASA, pro-permanent planning, they don't want to really acknowledge that adoptive parents can kill kids on purpose and actually torture them, that that can really happen. I find a lot of reluctance to admit um, that kids can be mistreated in foster care. You know, I train CASAs here in this state all the time. They don't, many of those CASAs don't want to hear for a second that uh, adolescents in, foster, in uh, foster care may not be safe and particularly in residential care facilities. People don't want to admit here who are parent advocates that that birth parents can actually kill kids on purpose deliberately and sadistically. They don't want to admit that. So there's a general kind of a broad denial here among all groups in child welfare with all perspectives around just not wanting to admit what you don't want to be true. But it is true. And so to try to get these things in balance here, we do need more poverty-related stuff at the front end. We do need more family support stuff at the front end. We do need ways of responding to families in an early intervention way without a CPS report. All that stuff is true. And then we also need to be able to respond appropriately when kids are being very chronically neglected and chronically maltreated. And what that means is a lot of focus, not just on child safety, but on child development, on child well-being. And on the kind of harms that happen to kids as a result of child maltreatment that don't have to do with immediate physical injury, but have to do with cumulative developmental harm and emotional harm. That's what's going on in chronic neglect. So last year in this state, for example, because 
I wanted to bring attention to these issues. I wrote a succession of sounding boards on the subject of all-cause mortality. That is, not just deaths that were due to child maltreatment, in this, but were due to illness and disability where neglect poor parenting was for a cause thing there, right? So it turns out that kids who are chronically neglected have higher rates of all-cause mortality. That is, they don't just die for the most part from some kind of neglect-related thing, drowning in a bathtub or a parent rolling over on a child. No, they die of illnesses. And to a certain extent, because their immune systems have been compromised by neglectful kind of pain. Kind of pain there. So there needs to be different ideas about what, it, what is child safety. In this state, for example, that has been defined as some kind of imminent harm, immediate present danger kind of idea. That's just wrong from the standpoint of chronic neglect and chronic maltreatment. And yet the, our child welfare system, I'm speaking to one here, that's the definition of child safety they, they use, and that has actually been now embedded in law, if you can believe it. So there has to be some broader understanding here of what's happening with child maltreatment. It isn't just that kids are being physically harmed in the moment. I mean, it's what's happened to them over time, including over a lifetime here. Um, so all-cause mortality is is means not just in childhood, it means throughout the lifespan. So, D, let me just break in for a minute. <clears throat> um, we, we usually go till 3.30. We got a little bit of a late start. Uh, I, you know, I'm certainly happy to go another uh, 10 minutes or whatever, but I, I want to let people off the hook if they, if they want to check out. And I want to ask you if you are willing to hang in a little longer. Yeah, <laughs> sure. No, I'll hang in as long as there. So, and then also, to say this again, I let me give you my, my email address is dwilson13 at aol.com. Anyone who has an interest in any of these subjects that we talked about here who wants material, I mean, you can look it up on my website, but you also can send me a request. And if you send me a subject, I'll send you something that I either written about it or if I have other material on the subject, I'd be glad to send it to you. I have a lot of uh, material here. So I've, I've written an awful lot on child death. I just want to say that. Not not, not, not just about child court, you know. So I've written a lot of other sounding boards on this particular subject from many standpoints, including the counting of it. Um, so, D, I have as well a, as, yeah, uh, which is, and I have my own answer to this, I guess. But how does a system go where you have thirty or fifty or a hundred reports of child maltreatment and the children are still? there with the parents. I mean, what, what, what is that mindset? I've never been able to figure that out. Maybe you have a point of view on it. I do have a perspective here and it because I've been doing this training now and chronic neglect for 20 years. And I asked people, and so maybe some of you know that for a long period of here, maybe 15 years, between about the mid-1990s and 2012, there was a huge reduction in child physical abuse and sexual abuse in this country. I mean, very large, over 60% but there was very little, if any, reduction in child neglect. So for years and years, I used to ask people, well, why would this be true? I mean, you know, why, why would there have been this huge reduction in physical abuse and sexual abuse, but not any reduction at all in neglect? And really, and as a way of answering the question, how can there be 30, 40, 50, 60 reports and kids are still living within a family? So the idea I've tried to get across here is that those kids are still there because public agencies and, and mandated reporters and courts are tolerating chronic neglect in a way that they would not tolerate chronic physical abuse or sexual abuse. So part of the reason is here is that because, and that's been tolerated in part because people in this state and in other states have not had an answer to the question, what would happen if we didn't tolerate it? And if that answer is we are going to put all these kids in foster care, that's not going to happen because that is a full at the end kind of situation, both in this state and in most other states. We do not have the capacity to greatly expand foster care systems. And because we don't, the end result is then we don't have an answer to the question of what would we do if we didn't tolerate this. So that's part of the answer. Part of the answer has to do with the you know, an uncertainty, uh, uh, an, an ambiguity. And so because chronic neglect has been so enmeshed with poverty, 
And because there is an unwillingness in this country to do anything about that much until recently, and I have to say in the last two years, what happened uh, during the pandemic and post-pandemic was just totally phenomenally amazing. I mean, this country made tremendous progress for a year or two. Now it's all going away. But we showed within a year or two that we could bring poverty rates down by 40% in 12 months. I mean, something amazing, something phenomenal, right? But in past years, there wasn't any kind of willingness to kind of uh, to do that. Now, the other thing that's contributed here in this state, I think in a lot of other states as well, that have had the workload problems and so forth, right? Child safety, as I've already said, has been defined narrowly as being present danger. Kids are in danger right now. And so the only kids that have been protected effectively in this state are ones that have current injury, usually serious injury at the time that the CPS report is made, or where a parent is virtually disabled due to substance abuse or mental illness at the time of the report. Those are the kids who are getting protection. The other kids, if kids present with minor injury or no injury, no matter what's being alleged in terms of a history or a pattern of parenting, or if a parent has a drug problem, but it's not evident at the time that the CPS worker goes out to meet the family or whatever, kids are not being protected. Because of the workload issues then, people are focusing very narrowly in a sort of tunnel vision kind of way on present day. And that ignores issues in chronic neglect and chronic maltreatment that have to do with patterns of behavior and that have to do with the cumulative effects and cumulative harms of maltreatment over time. So sometimes um, we've had cases in this state, for example, where families have been finally, there had been a dependency filing after 50 reports. And you know, the caseworker will go in front of a judge and the juvenile court judge will say, what in the world were you guys thinking? You're bringing this after 50 reports? And there's never any answer to that, right? Because, you know, most of those reports were from minor neglect kind of things, right? Most of them were, which were just shrugged off. Sometimes the parents received services. A lot of times they didn't receive services. And then there has been not much of a, 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 a even awareness or a recognition that there is kind of a, that kids are living in a condition. I mean, a lot of times the caseworkers are focused very narrowly on incidents as opposed to patterns of behavior. And there's not even a recognition or a, about what's happening over a long period of time. And just one other thing, last year in this state, the legislature, under a lot of pressure from child advocates here, actually passed a law saying that the standard for child removal in this state is the threat of imminent physical harm. The, the, so that's just completely ignoring all the 30 years of research on neglect and on chronic maltreatment. That's the thing. We don't care. Um, and so, yeah, so now in the last two or three years, the whole thing has been more, you know, made even much more difficult than it was before by the, you know, strong tensions and divisions over what the future of child welfare ought to be in this country. And so there's, you know, a big abolition movement, a lot of people who want to just wipe out child welfare entirely and completely. And um, so the idea that somehow it's going to be expanded in some way that that's in this state, that's kind of a non-starter, even though in regard to the chronic neglect, chronic maltreated kind of kids, that really is what needs to happen. Here. So this is a, very, very troubled time in child welfare, to say the least. And it's not like past years were great. But right. now we have reached where it's really a question of whether a few years from now we're going to have much of a child welfare system at all. I mean, things have gotten to be uh, to that to that point here. Um, <clears throat> Other questions here? I don't know. I have so I have so much. Dee, I'm so excited to talk to you. This is your friend Marie Cohen, and I've never even talked to you. Oh, let me. Oh no, you can't see me. That's why I took myself off the video. Um, there's just too much. I can't even know. Where, I guess I have a comment and a question if you have time. And it's all totally yeah. agreeing with you. Um, Dee is like the most brilliant person I know. He's just incredible. I think I should make my blog just like 
rehashing his and that would be good enough but and i might do that next time but anyway um my um my comment is that the all-cause mortality thing is so true and one of the the way i see it is i'm on the child fatality review committee and i swear i mean anyone i'm i can't have any influence on this committee at all but i'm just there to see what the cases are and the one thing one thing one cause of mortality that you didn't mention is gun violence so if you look at the kids mm -hmm. died of gun violence inevitably they're from unless they were quote an in, innocent bystander you know but usually they're kids who are involved in violence they they've been involved in crime and violence and they had the 20 reports you know um i haven't seen the 30 40 and 50 i wonder why that's amazing maybe they're not finding some but anyway they they have 20 reports and and nothing was ever done and it, it started with school with school absenteeism and it just went on and on and on and nothing was ever done nothing was ever done and so that's one example and i just see it over and over again um so so that was just a comment i wanted to make um about that and then my question was one thing that popped into my head a few times when i was thinking about this um about how could the system be changed so that we don't miss these kids is um what do you think about the um the focus on substantiation like uh, oh uh, maybe 20 years ago several writers were writing like time to leave substantiation behind because it is such we really should be caring about the risk to the child and this whole thing of substantiation i know in child fatality review i'm often told well we couldn't do anything because we couldn't substantiate you know and it's like oh my god you know you see what how these kids are living you know and and i've just wondered if you ever thought about that as as something that should be changed uh yeah and you probably i've written quite a bit on this particular subject as as have a lot of other people so there's a lot of been a research on substantiation decision making yes. so forth but the short version is substantiation really has nothing at all to do with whether kids were abused or neglected or not i mean it's not a credible measure of anything it's you know when you talk about you know a, a federal child safety measure is being two substantiations within some 12 month period of time. That's just a worthless safety measure and so forth, right? So no, I don't think substantiation should have any role at all in really in decision-making like what happens. You know, the weird thing in this state is that such a joke in this state, about half of the kids who become legally dependent in this state don't even have a substantiation. And yet they're being found legally dependent due to abuse and neglect because, because again, caseworkers don't want to don't want to do substantiation because they have to then go before administrative law judges if parents want remedies and so forth so they just don't do it oh. so no i don't think it has any role in decision making that's credible at all i just totally dismiss it as do quite a few of the other people that have done work on it like brett drake for example and diane english you know i just think that there is just a general I don't want to say cynical view, but I, you know, I just have a very dismissive view of the whole thing here. I think there really does have to be more of a commitment to early intervention here. I just want to say the most obvious thing again, which so many people have said over and over and over again, is that for many of the families, we're just waiting way too long and to, uh, to do anything about the problems that they have. And so, for example, especially the chronically maltreated kids who are in school age it's very difficult a lot of times and most of these kids by the way really are growing up in the family i mean a small percentage are being placed in care but most most aren't the, the kids who are growing up in the family it's very difficult to know what to do about those kids because for a lot of those kids residential care as it exists today is not a good response so it's very hard to know what the right response is once kids get to be in the school age area where they are moving then toward delinquent behaviors and vandalizing the community and school and all of that stuff. It's very, very hard to... So one of the things we found out about five years ago in this state, Diane English, after she is, you know, very well-known child welfare scholar who lives in Washington, I know her really well, I work with her at Casey. After she retired from Casey, she did a study of kids in residential care in this state um, about their backgrounds and so forth. Well, guess who's in residential care? It's the chronically maltreated, chronically neglected, chronically maltreated kids who grew up in the birth family. That's who was actually in the residential care system in Washington State. 
for the most part. Kids who have these extensive kind of history. And so Did again, you, no, sorry, sorry, never mind. <laughs> yeah, the idea here, of course, is back to we got to do something at a time when therapeutic interventions have a possibility of being effective. So the poverty-related stuff has tremendously positive effect if you do it in a time of early on kind of a way. By the time that kids get to be chronically neglected, standalone poverty-related interventions are not going to be enough. They're not. They're not. They're not going to be effective. Because the, the, have, if I can ask, if you don't have substantiation, then how do you ever get to a point where you know you could remove a child? Isn't that a precursor? Yeah. yeah. So on here, so the, the the basically great finding over a long period of time. He's a guy you know at Washington University, along with his wife, was a Johnson Reed. What what Brett Drake found years ago was that the main role of, of substantiation was as a, a factor in court action. That is, if you were if uh, if ultimately child welfare agencies wanted to file court action, then substantiation was a good thing to have from the standpoint of judges to convince judges that there really were issues within family. And that's why that's to me that's pretty much the sole grounds for using substantiation now is because it still plays a role in judicial decisions. Um, now, I've already mentioned, however, in this state, a lot of kids end up being made um, legally dependent who don't have substantiation. But nevertheless, a lot of times, uh, substantiation history is useful at convincing the court that really something needs to be done here. And so insofar as court as, as agencies have to engage in substantiation practices, they're required by law to do that. It's still important that they substantiate cases where they have believe that kids have been abused or neglected. I mean, so um, so there, is, there is a point in doing it, right? Well, um, I think it's not, however, a good basis for deciding who gets services, who does not get services. That, that's a very poor use of, 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 of substantiation. Right. Yeah, well, for that reason. Well, I think we probably ought to, ought to call time on this. I could go on. I mean, I have at least 10 questions I've accumulated since uh, we started or things I would like to talk about more, but I feel like we ought to let our participants off the hook if they want to go. Um, but if I don't know. Um, can you? No, I, I perfect, if, if people still want to talk, I'm perfectly willing to stay on for another few minutes to answer questions or to listen to comments or whatever. So. Well, and I would say that if you have something else to do or we just wore you out, feel free to, um, you know, just uh, check off at this point. But uh, I'll, I'll take you up on your offer myself, Dean, because there were things I you know, wanted to pick up on. So, um, well, how about we say it's the, that the webinar is officially over, but everybody is willing to stay if they, they want to ask some more questions or have some more comments. So uh, I'll start out with one question. You were talking about children being removed from their children dying. I remember from my early days in the field, there was a theory that if you removed a child who was a scapegoat from the family, another scapegoat would emerge within a short period of time, like a matter of weeks. Is that is that still a current theory or is that like, that was a, might not be the case that people think that anymore. I, I don't know. I haven't actually read research on this particular subject in recent years, so I don't know whether there is even a current theory on the subject, right? So, and I can just say, just from my experience, that I haven't, this is just not based on research, just on my own experience as a CPS caseworker, as a supervisor, and so forth. I, I didn't find that to be true. I, I didn't find that because one child was removed that another child would fill that role. I mean, that wasn't an automatic kind of thing. Well, especially um, if a lot and, of it's focused on adoptive children or children who came with a lot of issues. So it would not make sense. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm done. If somebody else wants to jump in. I should just tell the, the group, since we're talking about this, that um, in our study that we're doing of child fatalities, we asked Dee and, and one other expert he connected us with to look at uh, a dozen or so, I think these are 13 cases that we thought 
might fit the description of torture. And now this is 88 cases. So, uh, and I think we basically got a range of opinions from about six to about 10. Uh, and now that I have this uh, webinar under my belt, I can go back and apply these criteria myself and, and, you know, kind of have my own opinion about it. But out of 88 cases, you know, that's up around 10% or maybe more of children who meet the definition of torture. And, um, and some of them have been in the, you, all of you may have read about because they've been in the media a lot, Ariana Hunziker, Autumn Hallow, maybe Melody Vang. Uh, those are some cases of a boy named Justice Berlin. Almost all but one of these are really foster care or adoptive situations, the ones that I've seen in the let out of this group uh, that, we, that we asked you to comment on. Um, and so uh, it's sort of, you know, I thought it, I, it's a different, you have a different dynamic that this is a, you know, a, a child is very hard to deal with and they get into a power struggle because I was thinking it was some kind of a, a perverted, you know, rent a kid so you can kill them thing uh, because it just it seemed like that's all. They got the kid in the door and they started doing things like duct taping him to the wall so they could beat him more easily. That kind of, and, you know, really uh, sick thing. So um, anyway, there's, we've, not, we've noted, however you slice it, whether it's six or 13, there's an awful lot of, cases that, that meet the criteria for being tortured to death. Yeah, and just comment, Rich. I mean, one of the things you might look at is anytime you get a kid who's six or older, five or six or older who dies, that's very unusual. And that usually has to really, there really has to be a deliberate, lengthy course of maltreatment for that to occur. Okay. And so the, idea, the older a child is, the more likely it is that Torture would be an element of it. Okay, well, that's that the, okay. The child didn't die in a single really horrible physical abuse thing, or the child didn't die as a result of a gunshot wound or something like that. I mean, it was a, it was a course of it was a course of behavior. Okay, that's helpful. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so for everybody, we should be coming out with our final report in a month or so, so you can watch for it. We'll have it on the website, et cetera, on all these fatalities. Um, and then, hey, Rich, another yeah. thing to mention is that for years when I worked in the Washington State system, I have various roles, but one of the things I did every year is that I was part of a little group that reviewed all the child maltreatment fatalities or the ones that were suspected child maltreatment fatalities in the state, which used to be, by the way, in this state, about 20 to 25 cases a year. That's the way it used to be 15 years ago. So Washington State's population is about 1.7 million people. And that's the way it used to be, right? So after reviewing cases for years, I cannot remember a single case where, where I thought that torture was involved in the child's death. Not a single one. And I reviewed those cases over a period of years. And so now you're talking about a sample of cases where one out of 10, one out of, one out of 10 have elements of torture in it. So, I mean, something has, something bad has happened. Yeah. And I don't, that I have adequately answered the question: Why or why is this? Why 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 is this occurring with with greater frequency than it did in the past? That is really a, a pretty a pretty important question. I also want to mention before we forget before I forget is that Marie Cohen's on the call. She's done webinars with us in the past, and she does a blog as well called the Child Welfare Monitor. I highly recommend it. Uh, it, she does a great job as a journalist and a, and a you know researcher, um, and I half of my blogs come off of stuff that you do, Marie, because just you <laughs> a, a topic and it's uh, you know well, raises all sorts of issues. So I recommend it to everybody if you're interested in in the field. Oh, thanks so much. Well, as I say, Rich, I just worship um, I, I just worship D because and I love his blog. Um, and I quote him more than I quote, I quote you too, Rich, but I mean, he's so, he has so much work and I quote his work all the time. And, um, but I'm really proud of myself. I was going to send D an email, but now that you gave me that plug. So I just wrote a piece about um, residential care and the crisis that is happening everywhere. And I don't know if D noticed, because he sent me some criticisms, which are fine, but I think at the very end, 
end, I say, if we really want to do something about it, we've got to do something about chronic neglect and intervening sooner, because those are the kids who end up in, oh, um, in residence. So you. great yeah. minds, great minds think alike. But, um, but anyway, I do appreciate the plug. And I don't, do I have time for one other tiny question or not? It's up to you guys. Go ahead. Yeah. It, it just popped into my head, because, but I have to admit, I'm going to listen to the tape because I missed half an hour. A, a dear friend came to my door and I missed like the first half hour. So maybe I missed this, D, where you were talking about um, the characteristics of torture cases and, and I guess um, about the power struggle thing. Um, you know, I read a lot about those three horrendous cases and you mentioned Gabriel Fernandez. There were like three in a row in Palmdale, um, Los Angeles County. And I think to uh, Gabriel, Anthony, and then there was no uh, Anthony Alvarez, and there was no Quattro. I think two out of the three were little boys. I guess it was the older one. The last one was very little, but the, the other two were little boys who had said that they might be gay or maybe they're, um, you know, they seem to be acting. There was something about that. And I think those fathers were like very macho. And at least one of them was a member of MS-13. But I was just wondering how that fits in and you, whether you've seen other cases like that. And do you put that under the power struggle thing or have you thought about it at all? I haven't thought about it. I mean, you know, what you're saying is right, of course, but I haven't thought about it too much. I just think that to me, it's more like an excuse. I mean, it's like if you don't like a kid and you think of all kind of reasons why something's wrong with them or so forth. I mean, the thing about Gabriel, of course, he wasn't dealing with his father. He was dealing with a boyfriend. The same thing with this, you know, with a couple of the, you know, the, maybe you remember or read recently about the Sophia Mason case in Northern California in the Bay Area. And this was an eight-year-old girl who was, tortured and killed by her mother's boyfriend and sister also. And this child had been involved in, had been sexually abused, raped, and engaged in child pornography as well by the boyfriend, right? But the thing that stood out in these cases was that they had been separated from mothers at a very young age. That is, the kind of effective bonds that you expect to develop, hopefully, between parents and children very early in life. They just didn't have an opportunity for that to happen in these cases. And then, and then in these cases that I could tell, there was no erosion of or collapse of social norms around parenting. The parents didn't have any social norms around parenting. I mean, I, I think with the Sophia Mason case, they may have actually taken her back to sexual exploiter, maybe. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It could be a motive. I think sometimes it's just an excuse for cruelty. It's just an excuse for being yeah. mean. Another, another way of humiliating, you remember Gabriel, uh, the mother and the boyfriend sent Gabriel to school in girl clothes because of what you said. I mean, obviously, they thought there was something effeminate about him. And that was a way, a, a way to view. Right. Yep. Um, well, I think I better call time on this one because uh, um, I'm, I'm sure some people are being polite and uh would probably like to, to move on, but this has been great. Uh, you've gotten yourself in, in some extra work, Dee, because you know, I have follow-ups galore, uh, but uh, this is a, it's a new record in terms of how long we've gone. I hope we haven't, uh, uh, you know, gone too long for some folks, but it's been a really good discussion, and uh, I really yeah. appreciate it. So, I apologize. I apologize around the Zoom thing, but I couldn't do anything about it, but if if, if anyone wants to send me questions or requests, I'd be glad to follow, follow up on that. Great. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Dee, and thanks, everybody, for coming, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you yeah, so much. Thanks for hosting. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye-bye.